All right. Uh, thank you all for coming. This is the last lecture, and uh, I'll try to be gentle, as I know that some people are struggling a little bit today. So I want to explain uh, a conjecture which should solve combinatorial invariance for symmetric groups. Uh, and I think it's just interesting, and it also came out of the um, machine learning stuff that I was talking about last night. So as usual, we start with a quote. So this is from Claire Voisin, who's one of the best algebraic geometers in the world. And she has this beautiful article called How to Make a Portrait of a Bird. And uh, if you like this kind of stuff, I'd very much recommend reading this article. She, it's a beautiful description of the mathematical process. And she says, there's the monastic introverted period where we were just contemplating the ocean of our ignorance. And then suddenly something happens. The monk becomes busy and excited in a hurry to look more closely at the details. And I really love this article. She describes the kind of processes by which you're totally stuck and then you have an idea and then often the idea breaks. And um, can you please sit one row forward, please? Thank you. Okay, so I'd really recommend this beautiful article um, if you're interested. And this is a little bit what I felt happened here. Like I had no idea what to do with this combinatorial invariance. And then suddenly these structures started to emerge and we all got very excited. <clears throat> so what I'm talking about today is a new formula for Kajan analytic polynomials for symmetric groups. And what I've been trying to um, emphasize in these talks is that, so here's an interval. And we have to think about this interval as sitting somewhere within a Coxeta group. So, you know, I imagine this enormous Coxeta group and then I imagine Bruhar order on this enormous thing. And then I have this small piece and somehow I want to make a prediction about the Kajan analytic polynomial within this small piece. And I tried to explain the day before yesterday that if we have the edge labels of this small piece, then we can predict the Kajan analytic polynomial. But if we don't, the kind of standard way of computing the Kajan analytic polynomials is kind of start at the bottom and work your way up, 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 and then finally you get to the interval. And so that's kind of the difficulty of the problem is that you have to use a whole lot of information which is not present, which is somehow not in that interval. Whereas the formula that I'm going to present today is more complicated than the formulas that I've been discussing earlier, but it only uses information in that interval. So what it tells you is that you can look at that, in, that interval and make a prediction um, for the cartesian analytic polynomial. And somehow the predictions that you make depend on a choice of decomposition of your interval. So that's illustrated in this picture down in the bottom right. So we have to choose this kind of splitting of our interval if we choose such a splitting, we get a prediction. What we know is that one of these predictions is correct, but I can't, I can't prove that they're always correct. And, in, and I've never found an example where the, where the correction is not, predict, not correct. Okay. So it seems like something remarkable is going on, but I don't quite understand what exactly is going on yet. Uh, so, yeah, so it only uses stuff within the interval. Um, the, the cases of this that I can prove are when we have an, when we look at our bottom vertex and we look at the SN minus one coset through that element. So we look at the orbit under SN minus one through that element and intersect it. That would give me the red dots in this picture. And in that case, the formula is proved. Um, but yeah, as I said, we cannot yet prove that for any decomposition, the formula is correct. And uh, yeah, we've checked this on over a million intervals. So it, there's good experimental evidence. Okay. So this is kind of some kind of motivation for what's going on in the next couple of slides. Basically, I thought today would be half combinatorics, half um, geometry. And then I started writing the, writing the slides this morning in a somewhat tired state. 
and I realized that it's, in order to explain the combinatorics, I kind of almost need the whole lecture. So I'll almost not discuss geometry at all. So it'll just be combinatorics today, except for maybe one slide. So Bruja order is very, very complicated order. In particular, it is very far from being a lattice. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with kind of lattice theory, um, but what, la what lattices are, are post sets in which GCDs and LCMs, LCMs and GCDs exist. And if you're a post set theorist, you call this a meet and a join. And I can never remember what a meet and a join is. Um, but I find that notation, this V and upside down V useful because if you round it out, then it gives you the meet and join on sets. Okay, so meet is union of sets and join is intersection of sets. So the classic example of a lattice is all subsets of a set, in which case meet and join is just intersection and um, join. So that lattice is called the Boolean lattice after George Boole, who is the father of Alicia boole stoff who gave us the word polytope. polytope. Okay, so Bruja order is very complicated, very far from being a lattice. So this is the kind of essentially the only example we've ever been considering in this, in this course. Um, so here we have S and T, and you'll notice that this element is larger than S and T, and this element is larger than S and T. And so there's no GCD or LCM, sorry, LCM of S and T. And generally, if you take less than or equal to X and less than or equal to Y and intersect them, you get extremely complicated um, closed subset of your post set. Okay. So there's no way, like in I think it can have arbitrarily many maximal elements. So it's kind of very far from being a lattice. So the kind of remarkable thing, and I don't think, you know, I'm not an expert in combinatorics, but I don't think this has really been noticed before, is that symmetric, so Bruja order for symmetric groups seems to be built out of lattice-like pieces. Um, and the remarkable thing is that the ML models that I was discussing last night were basically pointing us in the direction of these lattice-like pieces. So one of the things that happened in this project is the machine learning models are saying, look at the following edges, and then I was looking at these edges and I was noticing that they have unique joins. Very, very often they have unique, unique meets and joins. And so you get these, it's kind of pointing us towards these lattice substructures inside Bruja order. And I started feeling like this is crazy. Like, you know, in every example I was doing, I was getting these lattices. Like, this cannot be a coincidence. Okay, so here we have a very simple post set, so an E hypercube. So what we do is we take a finite set and then we consider all subsets of that set and we draw an edge going down if we can for all ways of removing an element from that set. Okay, so here's, here are E hypercubes for a set of one element, a set of two elements and a set of three elements. So this is kind of the simplest post set you can imagine. Now, this is a kind of crucial definition. We say that a collection of edges spans a hypercube if there exists a unique map into our post set. So X is just a general post set at the moment. So we have our, we have some point, we have a whole lot of edges going into it. And we say that these edges span a hypercube if there's a unique way of completing it up like that. Okay. So this is both an existence and a uniqueness statement. And you should think about the exist, like something spanning a hypercube as being a kind of very strong structure. So now, so this is the same definition as we've just given. Okay, so this is spanning a hypercube. So we have some edges, we have a unique way of completing it up into hypercube. Now we come to a slightly more complicated. So this is an 
this is an attempt at axiomatizing what I was seeing in all these examples. So the, the statement is that a collection of edges spans a hypercube cluster if any subset of edges with incomparable sources spans a hypercube cluster. So what that means is that I have a whole lot of, um, so now I'm really thinking about a Bruja order. So I have a whole lot of edges coming in. And now it might be the case that I have two edges coming in and their sources are comparable. So this source is less than this source. So in that case, there's no condition. But if the sources are incomparable, then I can complete that up in a unique way. And furthermore, I can do that for any subset of my edges. This, this is like, I think spanning a hypercube is intuitive. This takes a little bit more thought to get your head around. Okay. So here's an example. If I take these two edges, so they span a hypercube cluster because the, their sources are incomparable and I have a unique completion. These also span a hypercube cluster because their sources are incomparable. Sorry, their sources are comparable. And so the condition just disappears. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah? Is the set of edges. So I'm saying this set of edges spans a hypercube cluster. Yeah. Probably. I mean, maybe it's good to. Yeah. I think. Okay, so I, I'm not quite sure what, what I've written, but I think that what, I'm, what I mean is clear. Yeah? So we have a whole lot of edges. They span a hypercube if we can uniquely complete it into a hypercube. And then I'm saying that a hypercube, spanning a hypercube cluster means that we have a whole lot of edges coming in. And for any subset of incomparable sources, so for any subset of edges where I can't, com can't compare the sources, I can complete uniquely up into a hypercube. So this one we went, we went why it's a, we decided why it's a hypercube, why it spans a hypercube cluster. Here we, um, so here the condition is kind of vacuous, okay? So any single edge spans a hypercube cluster. And here I have my, these two sources are comparable. And so, there's no condition on these two edges. So this one's also okay. So quick check that you're awake. Why, um, why does this not, I'll quickly get rid of the answer. <laughs> <laughs> why does this not span a hypercube bluff? No unique completion. <laughs> Sorry? There's no unique uh, hypercube. Yeah. Exactly, yep. Yeah. So I can complete this to a hypercube, but I can do so in two ways. So I have to have unicity, very important. Uh, so what do you mean? Mm -hmm. No, that's not a hypercube. Yeah, it has to be a hypercube. Yeah. So if I have a lattice, this is all trivial. Yeah. So, and so it's kind of like extract, extracting a lattice like part. So, what, sorry, Gahoi, Gaston asked, is this um, unique for lattices? And for lattices, it's kind of built into the axiom of being a lattice that you can always find these hypercubes inside. Yeah. 
So we're trying to extract kind of lattice-like parts of our. So what I found remarkable um, is the following. So here I, I'm, I take, so this is the full, so this is just W. And this is the, so W is SN. And this is SN minus one. Okay, so this is the, um, the subgroup generated by all the reflections up to SN minus one. So we have this enormous Bruja graph and we have this Bruja, so we have one Bruja graph of size N factorial, then we have this Bruja graph sitting inside it of size N minus one factorial. And the statement is that if, I, if I'm inside SN minus one and I look outwards into SN, everything that leaves, then that spans a hypercube cluster. It's kind of remarkable. So there's an enormous amount of complexity, but if you're in S minus, SN minus one and you're looking out, it's kind of lattice-like and simple. So here's the example for S3. Okay, I don't know why I wrote N equals two. So here's the example for um, S3. So here's S2. This is S2 here. And let's look at what this is saying. So it's saying at the, if I look out, so here are my two edges going out. We've just checked that that spans a hypercube cluster, hypercube cluster. And here we look out and we see that that spans a hypercube cluster. In fact, in this case, this just spans a hypercube. Okay. So that's not very impressive in S3, but I want to show you what it looks like in S4. Okay, so if we, so here's my um, Bruja graph with 24 elements, and here's my S3 sitting inside it. And if I look at the top element and I look out, I get this beautiful three hypercube. Okay. And as you move down, you get, so here's, um, here's looking out from an element kind of close down to the bottom, and I get this cube here, and this guy is bigger than these two. And so there's no condition for this one and these edges. So this also spans a hypercube cluster. Here's another example of kind of a similar behavior, but kind of opposite. So here I have one element that's less than these two. We get this beautiful cube here. And then this guy is less than these two. So there's no condition on this edge and this edge or this edge and this edge. Okay. And if we look out from the identity, we, so these, these edges are all reflections which, um, let's say, move in. So these, are, so these edges are those edges which don't, which those reflections which don't lie in SN minus one. So it's everything that moves N and something. And these are all comparable in Bruja order. And so I get no condition on being a hypercube cluster, basically. Like no non-trivial condition. It, it seems to me quite remarkable and quite beautiful that this structure exists. Jordy, does this uh, depend on the embedding of SN minus one? Uh, so as long as it's an embedding as a standard parabolic subgroup, it'll be true. Okay. Did people, everyone here heard the question? So this is a second key notion due to my student Leonardo, Leonardo Patimo, otherwise known as Leonardo Uno. Uh, so a subset is diamond complete. So this looks like a kind of innocent condition. It's extremely useful. Uh, so what it says is that so I have a subset of um, I have a full subgraph of a Bruja graph, it's diamond complete if whenever it contains the lower two edges of a diamond, it contains the upper two edges of a diamond. So this is a diamond. A diamond is what you think it is. Whenever it contains the lower two edges, it contains the upper two edges. Okay. So this is diamond complete, but this is not, okay, because I have these. So here's a diamond. And 
it contains the lower two edges of the diamond, but not the upper two. And how does one think about diamond complete? So you can see that if I intersect Bruja graph with a coset of a standard parabolic subgroup, this is always diamond complete. But um, if you're just looking at kind of combinatorially, it's impossible to say intersection with a coset. And this is some like weak substitute. So it's definitely not true that any diamond complete subset is an intersection with a coset of a standard parabolic subgroup. But it's kind of morally, like I would like it to be mor morally true, um, even though it's very far from true in reality. Okay. But it's a very, it's, it's a rather strong condition on a, um, on a subgraph of a Bruja graph. You generally won't find that many diamond complete subintervals. Okay, so now we come to the key definition. So that puts the two, two things together. So we have our big Bruja interval. X and Y. So a hypercube decomposition consists of the choice of an inductive crown, C, somewhere here. And so then we look at all the elements less than C. such that, so this piece here is diamond complete. So that's that condition here. And now, no matter where we are in here, and we look outwards, we get a whole lot of edges going outwards into, into the unknown world of our non less than or equal to C. And those edges should span a hypercube cluster. That's the definition. And yeah, it took me about 14 goes to find this definition. I was like trying to find definitions that encapsulated um, what I was seeing in all these examples and I would find a definition and I would write it, I would send it to Alex and I would say like, does this work? Can we make a conjecture with this definition? And Alex would write back, no, it fails on S6. And I would change the definition a little bit, write back, and Alex would write back, no, this fails on S7. And then I would change the definition, send it back. Alex would like, no, it, follow, it fails on one element in S8 or something. And so I was like getting closer and closer and closer to a definition that worked. And then at some point he's like, I don't have a counterexample across the whole data set and it's been running for two weeks or something. And then I was like, yes. So, yeah, it was kind of like convergence to a convergence to a correct definition rather than writing it down correctly immediately. Okay, so here's a here's an example, kind of non-trivial example. So, um, the, in in the paper we do two examples. One's kind of trivial, and this is the non-trivial example. So here's a you know a big interval, and this is already a, a kind of size that I have no idea how to think about really. And um, this is an example of a hypercube cluster. So, um, so here's my C. So what I'm claiming here is that if you look out in this direction from, so firstly, I'm claiming that this piece is diamond complete. So there's no things of like that in here. And the second thing is that if I look out from any edge here, so here's an example where I look out. These are the two edges looking out. And look, I can complete it to a unique diamond. And here's the, the situation at the bottom. I'm looking out, I get these three edges. This one is less than these two. And these two complete to a beautiful diamond. So now this is the most important example. This I kind of call it the, hy the canonical hypercube decomposition in my head, but it's not really canonical, but anyway. Um, but it's definitely the, it's the example where we can kind of prove everything. And it's this example of the coset. So here's our interval. We, we look at the SN minus one coset through X. Okay, so SN minus one is the permutations that fix N. Uh, and so this is a big, you know, I'm thinking about this as being some 
subset inside a massive, inside all of the symmetric group. And then I look at this thin slice, which is this SN minus one orbit through, and then I intersect it. And the claim is that this has a unique, so generally I would not expect such an intersection to have a max. No, this is not a lattice. In this miraculous situation, there exists a max. That's my C. And the claim is that this C provides a hypercube decomposition of this interval. And one of the exercises on the exercise sheet today is to verify that there is indeed a max. And also there's something really beautiful, which is that this, this element here has the miraculous property that it admits joins with anything out here. So, you know, normally when I intersect two elements here, I expect the, the intersection to be very ragged, but this magical element has a nice intersection with everything. Okay, so here's the conjecture. So it says, so we choose any hypercube decomposition of XY, and it says something is equal to something plus something. Pretty good conjecture, eh? I'm pretty proud of it. Um, so something is something plus something, and um, yeah, I've got to explain to you what the somethings are. So this is called the um, the kind of derivative of the Kaczorowski polynomial. Here's the formula. I'll explain what it means in, on the next slide. Um, this is. Uh, basically what it says on the box. So it's basically saying, uh, so I'll, I'll explain this hypercube piece in a little bit of detail. So I'll just give, I'll, I'll explain what this hypercube piece looks like in the simplest example. Okay, which is when we just have, we don't have a hypercube cluster, we just have a, an actual. Cube, and this is inside our big interval. So here, here, here is x, and up here is y. And now, for any subset of these edges here, I get a unique element up here given by the join. Okay. So for example, if I take the, the subset of all elements, then I get the top element. If I take the subset just consisting of a single edge, then I just get this element. So there's a map from subsets of these edges up into my Bruja graph. And then I just take the endpoint, endpoint that like that element, take the Kajdanlitzig polynomial at that point to the top and multiply by Q inverse minus one to some power. So this, like this kind of looks complicated, but it really is just like what it says on the box. Yeah. It's just, we're set, set, picking out certain kinds of polynomials from the interval. And this inductive piece I'll explain in a second, and this I'll explain in a second. Okay. So in this most important example here, this is a theorem. And from this, we can, can, we can recover the Kajanitsky polynomial in a very easy way. So what I'm saying is that if you, if you give me an interval, so what Dyer says is that if, if you give him an interval and you give the labeling of the edges via reflections, then he can tell you what the Kajdanovsky polynomial is. And what I'm saying is something weaker, which is that if you give me the interval and you give me, you tell me what the SN minus one coset through the base, set, base point is, then I can also tell you the Kajdanovsky polynomial. Yeah. So that's kind of getting closer and closer to, to solving it. Okay, so firstly, what's this Q derivative? So basically speaking, we have the following picture. So, um, oh, firstly, I'm using, somewhat annoyingly, I'm using the other normalization of Kajdanovsky polynomials. So here's the relation between these two normalizations. So um, in the normalization we've been working with, the Kajdanovsky polynomial is, is of the form V to the um, length of the interval. Um, plus lower terms in V. And what we do is we sw swap this around so that we get a polynomial in Q, which is of the form one plus higher terms in Q. Okay. 
And this picture is meant to relate, illustrate the relationship between Kajanalitsic polynomials and this Q version. So basically, if you're familiar with SL2 representation theory, then the passage between um, this polynomial and the Kajanalitsic polynomial is taking lowest weight vectors. So if you imagine, so my um, Kajanalitsic, my Q derivative would be P, X, Y, D. In this case, it'd be one plus Q plus three Q squared plus, what's that? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, plus three Q seven plus Q to the eight. I'm sorry if you can't read this, plus Q to the nine. And then my original Kajanalitsic polynomial would be one plus two Q. Okay, so here's my original Kajanalitsic polynomial, and then here's the Q derivative. And the Q derivative is somehow easier um, for various reasons, which I might get to at the end. Okay, so that, yeah, so given the Kajanalitsic polynomial, this is this Q derivative, and it's very easy to move between the two. Sorry? Yeah, thanks a lot. It's very helpful if I get the only example correct, isn't it? Uh, okay, and I think I roughly explained what the hypercube piece is. And now the inductive piece is basically what we do is we take, so, in this whole business, it's kind of a funny business. Like I was trying to explain that um, yesterday that we have this big Bruhar interval and we can kind of assume that everything in sub intervals is known. So you can assume that like anything up to almost the top is known and everything from the top to almost the bottom is known. So in particular, everything occurring on my SN minus one coset, I can assume is known. Okay. So I know all of the Kajanalitsic polynomials, everything. And what I do is I take all of my Kajanalitsic polynomials that are inductively com computed on this big piece, restrict them to this smaller piece, and write that in terms of the Kajanalitsic basis for that smaller piece. So that's what I'm doing here. So C, um, CV is the Kajanalitsic basis for this smaller piece. And then we take our our basis where we, so we, we, we know everything except for the very bottom and restrict it to this much smaller piece and write it in terms of our Kajanalitsic basis. This produces these coefficients gamma V and then we use our um, knowledge of the Kajanalitsic polynomials on that smaller piece to form this inductive term. And what is really remarkable, so I'll, I'll talk about that in a second also, is that these um, appear to always have positive coefficients. So in Kajanalitsic theory, there's this kind of like many, many mysterious positivity properties that people work very, very hard to establish. And somehow when you notice a new one, then you can get excited. And so this is another example of where a positivity property is kind of appears to be coming um, for no, no good reason. Well, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so in the case of the canonical one, I know what's going on. I'm taking an IC sheaf, I'm restricting it to a sub variety, and for some rather sophisticated reasons, it stays pure. And so it's a direct sum of shifts of IC sheaves, and hence has positive coefficients. And for some reason, this is happening for a general hypercube decomposition, or it appears to be. Okay, yeah, so. I'll probably finish a bit early. Um, so that's the conjecture. Um, maybe it's yeah. I, I don't know how motivated everyone is. So maybe I'll just give the last slide, and if you if you're motivated, then you can ask questions. So uh, here's the here's the conjecture, and I just want to explain very in very rough terms, what it means geometrically. 
and it appears to be pointing to something quite remarkable happening geometrically. So the first important point is that, so yesterday we were talking about IC sheaves and I was talking about local intersection cohomology. So I was saying we have a singular point and we want to compute locally what the stalk of the IC sheaf is. Now, there's an important trick in geometric representation theory, which is you can, you can convert a local question into a global question. So what that means is that you basically speak, basically speaking, so you have a singular point and what you can do is delete that singular point and quotient by a certain torus action to produce a projective variety of a dimension one lower. So the idea is that like, if you're at your sing singular point, that's a local question, but you can kind of imagine like looking out to infinity and you see a projective variety and that projective variety controls the stalk of the IC sheet. And basically the passage from the, the local stalk to the cohomology of, the, of this global projective variety is exactly the passage between the Kajdanistic polynomial and the Q derivative of the Kajdanistic polynomial. The upshot of all of this is instead of having a local question, I have a big space, which in this particular case looks like a giant blue egg, this big space, and I want to compute its um, intersection cohomology, its global intersection cohomology. Uh, now, uh, what all this business gives, so these two pieces, the hypercube piece and the um, inductive piece give me two closed sub varieties inside this big space. And normally, if I were to go up to you and say, I have a space and I have two closed pieces into, inside it and I can compute their cohomology, can you compute the cohomology of the big space? You'd say, you know, you're bonkers. You know, like this, just knowing something about two closed sub varieties inside a big space doesn't tell you really anything about the big space. Yeah? But there's certain cases where it does. So you could imagine, for example, that like we have a closed sub variety here and, and the rest is a vector bundle over this piece. So now the cohomology of this piece would be the same thing as the cohomology of the vector bundle. And so you would have more like an open closed decomposition. And you would start thinking that maybe this is possible. Yeah. And what appears to be happening is for no good reason, the cohomology of this whole space breaks up as something like the cohomology of this plus the some shift of the cohomology of that. Okay. For no particular, like I can't see why, why it should be true. In the special case, I can see why it's, why it's true, essentially because of this vector bundle business. So the final remarks on the conjecture is that um, in many, many, hyper, my, many hypercube decompositions exist um, and some kind of never occur for any kind of good reason. So they're just, it seem to be arbitrary things. We've checked the conjecture on over a million intervals. Uh, there's a whole lot of kind of statements which are equivalent to the conjecture being true um, involving purity of cohomology. We have this positivity property that's remarkable. Um, and also it just seems to me that this, these, this structure, this hypercube cluster structure gives a lot of insight into Bruja order. And so there should be other questions about Bruja order which can be used, which can be attacked via these, these structures. And the other thing that I like about this is that truth is in there somewhere. So if you give me a Bruja interval in the symmetric group, I can produce a whole lot of predictions based on all these different ways of decom ways of forming this hypercube decomposition. And I definitely know one of them is correct. Yeah. So, um, and in every single example I've done, like all of them are correct, but it's also possible that there's some argument like you can tell, you know, even if one is wrong, you can kind of tell it's wrong by comparison with the other answers, for example. That's, that's actually something that I've recently discovered actually does happen in combinatorics rather a lot that you, you have a whole lot of ways of 
ways of making some prediction and then you like look at the minimal prediction or something like that and then that's the correct prediction okay so that might be a way of attacking this conjecture so thank you very much for listening So Anna just asked, are there any questions for Hawaii? That was Anna's question. Nothing. Are there any questions here? Leonardo, do we? So, for another different hypercube decomposition, I, I believe I provably have this picture. So I have this variety. I have the closed sub varieties, um, but. I have no idea why the prediction made by these closed sub varieties should be correct. Yeah, I know that there's no torus action, for example, that sucks a piece onto, yeah. That's interesting. Jordan, could you repeat the questions? Ah, sorry. Um, Anna was basically asking, is there some kind of statement like, um, if you consider all possible non-trivial hypercube decompositions, does this kind of cover a part of your Bruja graph, like maybe cover the lower part of your Bruja graph? Oh, yeah, that's definitely true. So, so Anna was saying in, in one hypercube decomposition, is it true that you kind of see the whole interval? And that's absolutely true. Yeah. So, um, so if you look at the kind of hypercubes leaving the, the in, inductive piece, then you get all the vertices, um, but perhaps multiple times. So we already saw that in S2, that the kind of top vertex is like part of a hypercube from the identity, and it's also part of the hypercube from the from T or something. Yeah, I, so it depends what you what what your definition is, but um, so here's um, S two, and then the hypercube leaving from the identity looks like that, and then the And so this vertex you kind of get twice and you definitely cover all the, the whole interval. Yeah. Another thing that um, like I've been thinking about with Chris a little bit is just this fact that it kind of seems like you can describe the whole interval by this piece plus very limited data on so you can kind of you could imagine building up Bruhar intervals inductively where you say, like you take a Bruja interval and then you specify kind of some minimal data on each of the vertices about what goes on in that direction. And then that allows you to recover your Bruja interval. Yep. But that's still not clear. Fern? So Fern asked what is morally special about the symmetric group, which is a great question. Uh, for me, what is morally special is the, what people call the mirabolic um, property. So uh, how I prove the statement um, 
in symmetric groups is if you look at, so SN minus one corresponds to this Levy subgroup. And now, if you look at what's not in this Levy subgroup, um, this is in some, this is um, in some sense Tory. So, and that's totally remarkable. So I, I can, maybe I can speak to you, um, those that are interested in explain like why that's mysteriously toric or something. But basically like the, the key thing in symmetric groups is that the difference between SN minus one and SN is not that much. If you look in another group, um, you know, the, the, the quotient of like a vial group mod a maximal parabolic subgroup is, can be enormously complicated. Whereas um, in SN, you have these two special maximal parabolic subgroups, SN minus one kind of permutations that fix N and SN minus one permutations that fix one. And the quotient is very small. And um, that's what's special about symmetric groups. And also this conjecture, um, I suspect that if you can find a hypercube decomposition for a general Bruhar interval, then the conjecture should hold, but it's definitely not true that you can find hypercube decompositions in general. In any coxeta group. So the combinatorial invariance conjecture. So Anna's asking, like, how does this fit in the grand scheme of things? So the combinatorial invariance conjecture is for any two intervals in any two coxeta groups. So it's incredibly strong and incredibly general. Um, all of what I'm talking about today is only symmetric groups. So I would conjecture that if you can find a hypercube decomposition of a general interval inside any coxeta group, then the conjecture predicts the correct answer. Um, but we, d we definitely know that not all intervals support hypercube decompositions. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I forgot your name, but the question was, do you have a sense of which coxeta groups would have the property that all of their intervals support hypercube decompositions? I would say that I would guess, it's a total guess, if... Um, all your intervals support hypercube decompositions, then you are SN. Yeah. Uh, Leonardo asked a great question, which is, did I try to train the machine um, for, in other groups? Um, and the answer is no, and that's a complete elephant in the room. You know, I would, I would love to do this for BN and see what you get, or you know, other like set of groups, it seems, I just haven't done it. <laughs> Maybe uh, someone would like to do it who's a student. <laughs> uh, yes, Gaston? Uh, so Gaston is asking, is there some something that, um, would make me believe that the conjecture is false in the symmetric group. Well, one thing that would definitely make it, me believe that it's false is a counterexample. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't know, like, you know, I'm always skeptical about things. And when I start off working about stuff on this, I also thought maybe it's wrong. But um, yeah, like the evidence that I've seen about this suggests that it's correct and that the conjecture is also correct. So at this stage, my... Bayesian prior is that the <laughs> conjecture is correct, but certainly that could be modified modified by new information. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, M Madeline, I think. Uh, yeah, so it's so Madeleine's asking, um, where have we checked this? And uh, we've checked this on a, an insane number. So, basically, so I think like over a million intervals, non isomorphic intervals. So, like 
in general, if, if I give you an interval in like S7 or something, a big interval, it will have an enormous number of hypercube decompositions. So the statement is that we've checked it on a million intervals and all hypercube decompositions of those million intervals. Um, we started to get into computational trouble on large intervals in S8. And so we haven't checked it entirely on S8, but we've also checked it on a, a large number of new intervals in S9. So our coverage goes up to S7 completely. There's some, some things that we missed in S8, but yeah, I don't see that as like a big hole because they're somehow very, very large intervals and very large intervals tend to, like intervals near the top, like if you're, if you're taking an interval that's like saturating most of your symmetric group, um, the number of unusual hypercube decompositions drops quite a lot. And so the chances of being wrong in S8, I would say are extremely low. Um, and then we've checked that on a whole bunch of kind of interesting stuff in S9. Um, yeah, I think Chris had one more question and then, or some, no? How nice it is to see the sort of human aspect of tax on a really collected. Like, it seems like it's a big theme for the lecture last night, but also the quotes and the anecdotes, and like, I don't know, really bringing the human side of all of this, you know, mathematical content to life. Uh, I think that was really, really great. Uh, and also, we uh, thank you. Next Uh, what, uh, Joey, uh, we would like to say thank you in Hawaii. And Claire would like to say a short word. You can hear us, right? We can hear you, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you from everyone here in Hawaii. And it was a really fun class. And first, I spent like part of last year reading your Zergol by modules, the chapter in that book. And it was like kind of my ritual to read that like for fun. No, like no one knew I was reading and it. it was the only thing I could just do at my own pace and sort of not tell anyone and just see what I got out of it. And it became really like a special chapter and book for me. So then seeing you talk about it all week was just really nice. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Just <laughs>